Southern Gothic is a podcast that explores the history behind some of the American South's darkest days, greatest mysteries, and most chilling ghost stories. Stay tuned after today's episode for a bonus story from our friends at the podcast, They Are Not Shadows. In 1971, when Father John Wysocki was assigned to be the first pastor of the St. William of York Parish in Stafford, Virginia, he surely had no idea that only several years later, his Episcopal colleague, Father William Boyd, would ask him to come to his church and perform a ritual that only a Catholic priest could perform. Cast you out, unclean spirit, along with every satanic power of the enemy, every specter from hell, and all your fell companions. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, be gone and stay far from You see, for over a century, folks in Stafford believed that the old Aquia church, where Father Boyd was pastor, was incredibly haunted, and this was becoming quite a problem. Over the course of his tenure there, Father Boyd told a local newspaper that, quote, 187 people have been arrested for trespassing in the eight years he served the parish, and every one of them claimed to have been looking for a ghost. So one night in 1974, Father Wasaki joined Boyd at the historic church and began the Catholic rite of exorcism. St. John the Baptist, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. All holy patriarchs and prophets, Built back in the 1750s, the Aquia Church once counted American founding fathers like Thomas Jefferson and George Mason among its members, boasting a rich history. But that history has become overshadowed by some of the tragedies that happened over the years. In 1754, just prior to the church's completion, it fell victim to a severe fire leaving the brick building nothing more than a shell. The interior was of course rebuilt and the doors finally opened in 1757. But that didn't last for long as it was soon shuttered and abandoned due to the American Revolution and then again during the Civil War. But the church and congregation pride themselves on their resilience over the centuries which is symbolized today by a priceless silver communion set of a chalice, dish, and patent that was first dedicated in 1738, before the church itself was even built. With the threat of each war upon them, parishioners buried these precious holy objects for safekeeping until the danger had passed and they could once again re-enter the church and worship as a community. With a history as long and grim as the Aquia Church, it's no wonder why this place of worship earned a reputation for being so haunted that its pastor once felt the need to call on a Catholic priest to exorcise it and put a stop to the rumors. But as you can expect, that exorcism did little to stop the century-old tales, and if anything, it further cemented them in local lore. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. Walking through the doors of the old Aquia church is like stepping back in time. 
constructed with a red brick Flemish bond and a sandstone trim that were both mined from a local quarry. The interior of the Colonial House of Worship features a unique three-tiered pulpit with a sounding board and box pews that are arranged around a Greek cross design. Today, the church is known for its historically important and unique architecture. But according to legend, its reputation for being haunted is so entrenched in its history that author L.B. Taylor claimed, quote, through most of the 18th century, even the parishioners were afraid to go into the church at night. But it's not any of those historically documented tragedies, like the fire that consumed it, the abandonment after the revolution, or its destructive Civil War occupation that fuel these claims of spirits. Rather, it purportedly stems from the vicious murder of a woman, affectionately known today as Blonde Beth. When the Aquia Church was first constructed, it was done so using colonial tax dollars and was very much a part of the Church of England. So, as you can expect following the American Revolution, folks were eager to separate themselves from churches that were affiliated with the crown. And as a result, the building was abandoned and left in a state of ruin. It's said that one night during this time, a young woman attempted to take refuge in the church after a group of highwaymen attacked her while she was traveling a dark country road outside of Stafford. Somehow, the woman escaped her aggressor's initial attempts to harm her, and she managed to get inside of the abandoned structure, where she then hoped to hide from the men. But her attempts to evade them were unsuccessful, and soon enough, they too found a way inside. What happened next is entirely unknown, but it's believed that she fought back aggressively in an effort to save herself. Ultimately, though, the men took her life, and tragically, not a single soul in town knew what had happened. That is, until years later, when folks returned to the church in an attempt to revitalize it. It was then that they made the grim discovery. First, they saw the stains of old, dried blood that had soaked into the floor for who knows how long. They immediately began searching for what could have possibly left such a chilling mark, and eventually the parishioners found it up in the belfry. To their horror, the murdered woman lay crumpled on the floor, her body practically skeletal, with paper-thin skin still clinging to her bones. But eerily, atop her head was the long golden hair of a youthful woman. How this poor soul ended up in that third floor belfry is unknown. Maybe she fled up the stairs in an effort to hide from those men, only to be killed there. Or maybe the violence took place in the church proper and the culprits dragged her body up the stairs to hide what they had done, allowing themselves time to flee the scene of the crime without anyone knowing any better. Well, flee they did. And not only do we not know how long that victim's remains sat decaying in that empty church, but her identity has remained a mystery ever since. Although her memory is very much alive, as local lore continues to assert that centuries later, the spirit of this murdered woman still lingers there inside the Aquia Church. Over the years, Congregants have purportedly heard the sounds of disembodied footsteps echoing through the building at all hours of the day and night. And some have even claimed to hear what can only be described as a struggle 
coming from the staircase that leads up to the belfry where that woman's remains were found all those years ago. In fact, sometimes the sounds are accompanied by a groan, a whistle, or even a cry for help. In 1930, author Marguerite DuPont Lee included the first-hand accounts of a number of Stafford County residents in her book, Virginia Ghosts. Mrs. Agnes Montcure of Stafford stated that she lived close by a quiet church all her life always knew it was haunted, and tells of the above tragedy enacted more than 150 years ago. Mrs. Montcure says everyone speaks of sounds in the church as though someone was running up and down stairs. A number of people have heard heavy noises, suggesting a struggle was taking place. Upon entering, all is quiet. If that isn't eerie enough, some have also reported seeing the transparent figure of a woman standing in the church's windows on the balcony. Sometimes the apparition appears to be merely looking out over the wooded hilltop, and other times people have claimed to make eye contact with her before she smiles at them and fades away as if she was never even there. And according to a 1978 article in the Roanoke Times, quote, some say a skull is visible through these aquile windows at night. But perhaps the most well-known story of paranormal activity at the Aquia Church happened all the way back in 1862 during the American Civil War, when the church was again shuttered and left empty for the duration of the conflict. Ms. Dupont Lee wrote, Mr. John Waller of Fredericksburg relates that when he was a boy, he used to sit and listen to Mr. William Fitzhugh reminisce concerning the Civil War. One night, Fitzhugh and another soldier had had a hard day scouting and went into a quiet church to sleep in the square pews. Notwithstanding, they knew the church was considered to be haunted. After resting some time, both young men heard unmistakable footsteps at the rear of the church on the stone flagging. Soon the tune, the Campbells are coming, was whistled. Then more footsteps and the whistling again. This was repeated until steps and tune reached the soldiers. They jumped up and struck a light. There was no one in sight, but chancing to go to the door, the Yankees were seen to be advancing on the road, planning doubtless to bivouac in the church. The Confederates jumped out a rear window. For the rest of his life, William Fitzhugh maintained that had it not been for the whistling ghost, he and his men certainly would not have survived the encounter. And history very much backs him up on this, as the United States Army did in fact occupy the property, utilizing it as a makeshift hospital while soldiers camped on the ground surrounding it. As far as we can tell, William Fitzhugh's story about encountering a whistling ghost might be the first claim that the old Aquia church is haunted, but it certainly wasn't the last. And the way that the United States Army treated it during their occupation certainly didn't help to dissuade folks from believing Fitzhugh's story, because following the war, it was left in pretty awful condition. The June 27, 1887 edition of the newspaper the Norfolk, Virginia, described what happened. Federal armies camped out around it, and the hand of a ruthless soldiery not only was laid upon the venerable building, but also desecrated the graves of the dead, 
which lie in the graveyard surrounding the church. Many of the tombstones are exceedingly old, but having been so abused and broken by the soldiers, the names and dates cannot be deciphered. Over the years, some have speculated that it might just be one of those lost tombstones that marked the final resting place for the murdered woman whose spirit is purportedly still there. After all, her identity isn't the only mystery. Her final resting place is also unknown. So it shouldn't really be surprising that visitors have also claimed to encounter strange activity in the graveyard itself. Some who dared visit at night purport to have spotted what appears to be a ghostly woman's face floating amongst the graves, and one former church custodian reported seeing what he called simply, quote, things that were moving at night within the cemetery. Likely specters, he described their appearance as blurry and funny and as such, he said that he couldn't accurately determine if it was a man or a woman, but he said that they were whitish in color and slightly transparent. Of course, any attempt he made to move closer and examine it caused it to slowly fade away. Another well-known story occurred sometime in the 1890s. By this point, the church's reputation had spread through town enough that most were too afraid to approach it at night. But, as Father Boyd noted years later in the 1970s, what scared some attracted others. So one night, a young man bravely, or possibly foolishly, declared to his friends that no ghost could ever get the best of him, and either as a dare or as just a way to prove himself, he snuck into the church under the dark of night and climbed up to the belfry where the remains of the murdered woman were found. Of course, the boy knew his friends might not believe him if he didn't have some type of proof, so he took a hammer and a nail with him up there so that the next day when the sun came up, they could all go up there and see his nail in the wall, proving that he lived up to his word. But after hours passed and the boy didn't return, his friends gathered the courage to go searching for him. Fearfully, they made their way up those steps, but what they found at the top was truly horrifying. The boy was dead, and his eyes and mouth were wide open, frozen in a silent scream. It seemed that the boy had successfully hammered the nail into the wall but didn't realize he nailed his jacket as well. And to this day, folks claim that he died of fright when the spirit of the church appeared to him and he found himself unable to flee. Unfortunately, there's no actual documentation to support either the death of the boy or Blonde Beth herself yet the oral tradition has clearly been passed down through generation after generation of people living in Stafford, Virginia, eventually making its way into print with that 1930 book, Virginia Ghosts. As I previously mentioned, it was here that William Fitzhugh's story was first documented, a little over 60 years after it would have taken place. But what's truly notable, and maybe even most convincing, is that Virginia Ghosts includes the names of real people who grew up in Stafford and were not only aware of the Aquia Church's legacy, but also afraid of it, proving that these legends had existed for years before Marguerite Dupont Lee ever arrived. In fact, by the time she published Virginia Ghosts, the church's reputation was so entrenched that a prominent socialite who frequently spent the summer months in Stafford decided that she wanted to see the spirits of the church for herself, and as such carried out what today can best be described as a ghost hunt. This lady determined to make an investigation herself 
and sought the company of several Stafford County men in her proposed raid upon a quiet church at midnight. Her overtures were respectfully but firmly declined. Nothing daunted, the investigator motored to Washington to obtain the services of two scientists whose duties were to record noises and sounds she expected to hear. It was a very dark night they chose for their trip. The lady led the procession into the church, but just after entering the door, a hand slapped her in the face. It was a very severe blow, inasmuch as the mark remained several days. The scientists ran in, but nowhere could they discover any normal explanation, and they created so much disturbance in their search, no further sounds were recorded that night. Since that fateful night, the legend surrounding the old The Quiet Church has spread, whether it's true or not. And although Father Boyd made an attempt to, quote, squelch rumors of ghostly existence within by holding that 1974 exorcism, folks continue to claim it's haunted. During the church's bicentennial celebration, in the 90s, a group of Civil War reenactors stayed overnight on the property in tents that they pitched on the lawn between the church building and the graveyard. The following morning, as the pastor made his way to Sunday service, he stopped and asked the men how their night went, and their response was as eerie as you can expect. They claimed to have seen something strange inside the church a red-orange flickering up in the belfry that seemed to saw back and forth, back and forth, all night long. One man jokingly suggested it must have been a ghost, but then told the priest he should probably go up there and check the light bulb, because in reality, it was probably just a bulb loose in its socket. But to this, the priest smiled and told the men point-blank, Not only are there no lights up there, there isn't even any electrical wiring. Whether the old or quiet church is haunted or not is really up for the congregation who worships there to decide. Yet whatever they believe, doesn't change the fact that the local lore surrounding this colonial house of worship is just as much a part of its history as any other event that has happened there in the almost three centuries since its construction. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is an independent podcast produced by Southern Gothic Media. This week's episode was researched and written by Brianne Schecksneider and edited by Brandon Schecksneider. Additional voiceover work was done by our friend Jason, creator of the incredible podcast Santa May Be a Criminal, a true crime satire podcast about Santa Claus being arrested in a small southern Georgia town. And y'all should check it out. Of course, if you're a fan of Southern Gothic and would like more content, be sure to join us over on Patreon. Become a premium subscriber on the Apple Podcast app or get access to the Southern Gothic premium feed on Spotify. All of these options include monthly bonus episodes as well as ad-free content. For more information, be sure to visit southerngothicmedia.com today. And as always, thanks for listening. Lucky Lady Shacks.